just cut us off and staring me down. <laughs> He's staring me down. Cut us off. Welcome to Baltimore. My hometown of Baltimore, just a 45 minute drive east of the nation's capital, Washington, DC. Sitting as it does on the Chesapeake Bay, Baltimore has come to be known as Charm City because its inner harbor attracts a vibrant nightlife and thriving tourism business. But just beyond these calm waters is one of the most violent cities in America. Most of the crime in Baltimore is committed by black males, with other blacks as victims, making them an easy target of police. They'll lock you up just for running off at the mouth. You just, you can't win. They said that they found a gun in my room. I had no idea the gun was here, and they tried to charge me as an adult with possession of a handgun. And many believe the stereotyping of black kids starts early in America as early as grade school. Hey, baby, where my invitation? When your son tells you, Mom, I hate going to school every day because they just bully me and they pick on me, they never give Isaac the benefit of the doubt. Never. School and criminal justice systems biased against black boys, all echoes of my childhood. But I managed to avoid the trap of Baltimore's cycle of poverty and violence. But now I was going back to my hometown to get to the bottom of what I consider the new civil rights fight in America, educating black boys. One of the earliest memories of my childhood was growing up in this neighborhood and in this house in Northwest Baltimore. So you might have been the first family in this house after we moved out. Whoa. All these years, 40 odd years, a couple pastors. I lived here with my mom and sister. My dad left the family when I was just six years old. From that moment on, it was up to mom to provide for us, often working two jobs. The space seems so small now. You're a kid, it's just huge. The last thing she needed in those days was a rambunctious, mischievous son. One of my lasting impressions and memories of this house was my mom coming home from work early one day that I didn't expect. She goes to the, the short little back porch area that we had. She looks out over the backyard and sees me on the swings, <laughs> the swings in the playground of my elementary school. I'm playing hooky from school. I'm on the swings, thinking my mom is at work. She sees me, yells at me. I take off running. And, and when I get home that day, mom is saying, I saw you in the, you didn't see me. It wasn't me. Boy, go get the switch. Go get the switch. Everybody knows what that means, right? I performed well enough in school in those days to be considered one of the promising kids at the all-black elementary school I was attending. But as I was to discover in a very painful way, promising was not nearly good enough for the nearly all-white school I was bused to, Falstaff Elementary. Almost immediately, I felt I didn't belong. And I can remember being asked a question in class and not knowing the answer to the question and feeling totally humiliated. Totally humiliated. And I think from that point on, I just started to act out, right? I just started to act out, and they eventually threw me out of the school. Had some difficult days here. It seemed I just didn't know what the white kids knew at the time. I felt I wasn't as smart as they were. I was sent back to my all-black school, and I checked out. That was in the 1970s. Over the next three decades, nearly every institution in Baltimore, from education to the black family to the criminal justice system was transformed by the scourge of drugs and drug violence. While I was pursuing my career in Cleveland, Ohio and New York City, my hometown, Baltimore was fast becoming one of the most dangerous cities in America because of the cheap rock form of powder cocaine called crack. 
Baltimore's former mayor, Kurt Schmoke, says the 1980s was when the crack cocaine contagion in other urban centers found its way to Baltimore and took a devastating toll on the African-American community. Well, for us, it was a combination of, of two major factors. Uh, the crack epidemic, and then we had uh, a continuing uh, migration of the middle class out of the city. And I say that it wasn't a white flight, it was a class flight, it was a middle class flight because blacks as well as whites were uh, moving out of the city. So you had the, the drug problem and then this major concentration of poverty. The complaints were about, you know, the police shooting that guy through the windows. By the 1990s, I was anchoring a local nightly newscast in Baltimore working with many of the people in this room. And what we were reporting was heartbreaking. For nine straight years in the 1990s, the city's murder rate topped more than 300 per year. Mockingly, Baltimore became known as Bodymore Murderland. There is growing outrage in Baltimore about an outbreak of violence. The 19-year-old was the 10th murder victim since Saturday. Three people gunned down in Baltimore City overnight in one incident. And this noon, police searched for who did it. One of those three men was killed in the shooting. City police say the gunfire erupted last night. Baltimore's free fall at the hands of drugs and violence was turned into a television drama, and The Wire became an international hit. A little light to be announced, don't you think? You good then? Good. That's it. Take him down. While the murder rate is right now below 300 a year, large portions of the city remain in the grip of a violent drug culture, with African American males, most of them high school dropouts, as the chief architects of that violence. It wasn't supposed to be this way. Nearly 60 years after a landmark U.S. Supreme Court ruling ordered blacks and whites to share the same education resources and facilities, fewer than 50% of black males are graduating from high school. And worse, less than half of the black males who do graduate from high school at age 17 or 18 Less than half of them are reading at the level of an eighth grader or a 14-year-old. The underperformance of African-American males is a huge drag on our success as a nation. Um, Camille. Nancy Grasmick is the recently retired superintendent of Maryland schools, a position she held for 20 years. Her contributions are such that the headquarters of the Maryland Department of Education in Baltimore is named after her. In 2005, she was part of a task force to get to the bottom of why black males were underachieving in Maryland schools. The report concluded that there is a great deal of evidence to demonstrate that all children are not valued equally, that some children are clearly valued more than others, and finally, that African-American male children are valued least of all. It is true, it is absolutely true, that there is an element of racism in this, and that there has been this generalized attitude that African-American males are not going to perform well, and also that they are the students who are acting out, who are disruptive, and therefore let's suspend them or expel them from school. In 2010, after 26 years, Maryland settled a federal lawsuit where at issue was the placing of disruptive students in special education classes that didn't provide an equal education to students in regular classes. And what group, by a wide margin, was most often labeled in need of special education? African-American males. Under the agreement to end the lawsuit, Baltimore must give special needs students the support they need to get a regular education.
That's not happening for eight-year-old Isaac Sawyer. Isaac is very special. Isaac has the biggest heart in the world. Isaac walks down the street and sees homeless people and asks me, Mommy, can we take them home? Because they don't have a place to live. But at the same time, Isaac has a lot of problems. Um, they diagnosed him with ADHD and impulsive control disorder, which means sometimes he doesn't think about things before he does it. How do you feel about the, the education he's getting? Oh, I think it's horrible. My son is in the second grade, and before the beginning of this year, he couldn't identify the numbers one to 10 and made it to the second grade. How does that happen? Now we're thinking. Now we're thinking. Amen. Alicia is a single mother, raising Isaac in this ramshackle house with her sister, who is also a single mother of two young boys. Together, they are raising their mom's youngest daughter, their sister, while mom is away at a drug rehabilitation center. Single mom raising a black boy with special needs in Baltimore City schools. You got a better chance of hitting a lottery than getting that kid through mm -hmm. high school with a diploma. Yep. I know, and that's the reality. And that's what I have to look at and think about all the time. And that's what makes me, I guess, a little bit stricter than other people, me and my sister both, because we understand that. And me, not having a high school diploma, dropping out of high school when I was 15, 16, when I had my son, I don't want him to be anything like me. I don't want him to have to settle for $8 an hour, $10 an hour. I don't want him to have to work from paycheck to paycheck and work 60 hours a week and come home and be so exhausted he can't even play with his own child the same way that I am. So I know that first and foremost that he has to get a good education. The odds are against him. For Isaac and other underprivileged children in America, regardless of race, growing up poor in a high crime neighborhood means you often don't get access to the best schools or the best teachers. It is a different story for the children at Wood Home Elementary, a middle-class school. The difference in how these students are taught is staggering. We happen to be in a school today which has a large African-American population. Every one of these students, every cohort, African-American males achieving in above the 90th percentile. These students have had that early education, have high quality teachers here in this school. But is that pervasive to our entire system? Absolutely not. And until we come to grips with this, given the diversity of our population, not only in Maryland, but across this country, we are not going to continue to be competitive with the rest of the world. And deficiencies not addressed in early education are seldom corrected in later years. Douglas High School was one of two high schools I attended. It was an inner city school then, it's an inner city school now. After years of tuning out, I hit my stride at Douglas. In searching for a way to fit in, I found the school choir which led to the title role in the school play my 10th grade year, Oliver. The show was a hit, and its success gave me a huge boost of confidence. However, that confidence didn't translate into a greater effort or better grades in the classroom. But I think as we're able to kind of continue to celebrate the story and... Douglas right, principal so Antonio Hurt know, takes right, pride so in recent achievements in raising test scores at Douglas. Douglas but, way, hey. but he acknowledges that today, more than 30 years since I left this school, there is still a long way to go. So all of the African-American males, the black boys, who are eligible to graduate in this senior class, will they graduate? 
Wow. I wish, <laughs> I wish I could say that all of them would graduate, but what I can say is that um, we have done everything to kind of ensure and establish a platform for all of them to graduate. How many of the African-American males who will graduate this year are reading at grade level? Wow, now that's a notion. Um, we probably have about 50% of those young people who are not reading on grade level or reading where they should be as a graduate in a normal high school, if you will, or a normal high school diploma, whatever normal means in this, in this day and age. It is reading proficiency that ends up being the core skill that many black boys are lacking. If America wants to improve the academic success of black males, if it wants to set a new trajectory for global competitiveness in math and science, America must teach its black males to read early as black boys. The biggest problem I see uh, for American children in general, for large numbers of American children, is they never learn to read well enough to enjoy reading. Dr. Freeman Rabowski is president of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, a predominantly white honors college just outside of Baltimore. Rabowski was recently named to Time Magazine's list of the 100 most influential people in the world. Rabowski is so well thought of in education that U.S. President Barack Obama has chosen him to chair a newly created President's Advisory Commission on Educational Excellence for African Americans. We need to be encouraging much more reading in our families. In fact, what I often will ask kids is this. How many of you love to read? A few hands will go up. How many of you enjoy watching TV? All the hands go up. How many of you enjoy reading more than watching TV? They look at me as if I'm crazy. <laughs> you know, and I say, you know, the ones who are going to be most successful, it's okay to watch some TV, but the ones who are most successful will learn to read a lot because the reading is thinking, and thinking is power, power to control one's own life. Do you like to read? I like to read. You like, like to read? Yeah. Like, if I had a choice, it's like, read a book or watch TV. I'll watch TV, but like get to the book later. Eddie Blick Jr. is graduating from Civitas High School while reading at the level of a 10th grader, a 15-year-old. His favorite subject is math. You're good at math? Yes. How's English? Uh, I like it, but it's not my strong. Yeah, like, I'm strong at it. Like... Not your favorite? Yeah, it's not my favorite. Tell me why. Mm, it's, it's like... I can do it, I'm good at it, but I just like, I guess I like numbers. Most American kids will say, don't give me a story problem, give me the equation, because they, they don't mind doing the equation solving, but they are not accustomed to translating from the words to the symbols. But the point is that any problem in engineering, in medicine, in the social sciences, wherever, any problem is expressed in language, in words. You go from the words to symbols and then to numbers. Eddie was a terrific student until he gave in to peer pressure and let his grades slip to fit in. You were called a nerd for being successful in your classes? Yes. How'd that make you feel? I, I didn't care at first to like, to like some of the girls started saying, and be like, man, they might not like the nerd, so I uh, switch it up, because you gotta like, please the girls. Aside from peer pressure, there is another curious, self-defeating phenomenon impacting the performance of black males. Social commentators call it a cultural rejection of the English language, a decision not to learn to speak and write the English language properly. Prodigist, cast, either this terminologist, mean I'm getting no half a cent, money, acre rent. I'm cool niggas born like Levinus, Toastman, and Hamilton. Schooling the game facilitators, these niggas now penetrators, never had to take, but the world pro. Yeah, we see it, and, and if you look at a kid coming from home, and they hear mom and dad using certain language and saying things a certain way. So it's a process of trying to get them to understand why we need them to speak a certain way and write a certain way, and, and go ahead and continue to be behind that and insist that you're gonna do this the correct way. Yeah. 
Ron Sproul is a math teacher at Civitas Senior High School. I want the children, children need to be bilingual. Children need to be told that the way they communicate at home is beautiful, it is valued. But when you're at the workplace, this is like another country. You need to speak the language of that country if you want to be successful. I'm getting low like Lauren Matt, Ralph. Mess with my kids, something fishy, no trout. Leave you in the lake, now you're flowing with the sprouts. Leave no evidence, means no clout. The people speechless, but they still shout, I'm so going in, my level's going out. In this game, you Stephen Danny hopes street slang will make him a fortune. Like many of his friends, Stephen wants to be a rapper. But what happens to black males who don't make it as rappers or athletes? What are the options for black males without a strong education to support them? Consider this. Black teenage unemployment in America hovers at around 40%. That's higher than any other demographic in the country, by far. A lack of decent education leads to a lack of opportunity. That often spirals into crime and drug abuse, a cycle of entrenched poverty that is difficult to escape. The junkies on the corner, the little young boys who stand outside and sell drugs, um, the ones that stand outside all day and don't do anything with their lives, 26 years old, lives home with their mother, doesn't have a job, has six kids by four different women. When you go down the street, you see the blue light cameras all on the, that's what we laugh and joke, the blue light district. Whenever you see the blue cameras on the end of the street, you know that you're in a heavily drug infested, violent area. You said, on the night of your inauguration in 1987, it would make me proudest if one day it simply could be said of Baltimore that this is the city that reads. How did you do? I gave myself uh, only a C. Um, I gave myself an A for effort, but you know, in this world, uh, you want results. But the, the key, the big enchilada, if you will, of making a difference in the community is a significant improvement in the elementary and secondary education. And that's where I can say we, we didn't succeed. Just this year, in the U.S. state of Michigan, a class action lawsuit was filed by the American Civil Liberties Union. The state is being sued because hundreds of students in an overwhelmingly African-American district just outside of Detroit are functionally illiterate. Black males have paid a terrible price for academic failure. The lack of a proper education has had an impact on the family structures of the African-American community and on the nation's justice system. I've come back home to Baltimore, Maryland to explore a startling statistic. While 78% of white males graduate from high school in the United States, less than half, just 47% of the country's black males are graduating from high school. In New York City, that number is even worse. And increasingly, when black males drop out of the education system in America, the lure of fast money on the streets leads to another system, the criminal justice system. According to the U.S. Justice Department, black males make up 40% of all prison inmates. However, African Americans as a race make up just 13.6% of the U.S. population. In Baltimore, it seems every black male you talk to has had some negative interaction with police. Um, yes, just recently, um, last night, I'm coming from the basketball court at Federal Hill, had my shirt off, just walking back, and the cop was like trying to get us to fight him, I guess. The whole week was walking back just, just because I had my shirt off. Well, like a day like this, I was um, out on a day like this, and me and some friends were out. We were just sitting back 
with a couple beers, which we shouldn't have been outside doing that anyway. But, you know, they made it seem like we were like selling drugs or something like that. And, you know, they shipped us off to jail for the overnight. They've pulled me up a couple times. They thought I looked like a criminal, apparently. So, you know, I've been pulled up, asked what's my age, what's my ID number and everything. So this happened a couple times. The rate of black incarceration suggests there is something more going on beyond racial profiling. Judge Stewart, is there a bias in the criminal justice system against black males? Yes. I assembled a group of Baltimore judges, prosecutors, and defense attorneys to discuss why so many black males are in prison. Can you explain that bias, please? I think it starts way before it gets in the courtroom. I think that you walk down the street and you see folks standing on the corner, if a young African-American guy, can I just say black? If a young black kid walks by, somebody puts the purse closer to them. If it was three white guys, they wouldn't do that. The broader point is, poor black neighborhoods are policed more aggressively. The police, we're going into a high drug neighborhood. They talk about the neighborhoods in which people live as if they were the jungle. This is how they talk about where people live. Well, this is where you are. But maybe if you went to some other neighborhoods, you would see the same thing. But it's, it's where they know they can get the numbers. It's where they know they're going to find what they're looking for. You know, so it's saying if you don't look, you won't find it. Now, I'm not saying that it's not happening there. But I think it's a bias that we have, as society, we've pretty much adopted and the rap music and what people now call style and all this other kind of crazy tattoos and all of that stuff doesn't help any. I don't agree. I don't think the system is biased. I think that it, there is a community of problems and issues, but I think the fact that we have diversity on the bench and we have judges who are not going to treat that young black man. But before they get there. Like, uh, well, it, but he asked a question about in the criminal justice system. And when he says that, he's talking about in my courtroom. And my answer is no. And I'm thinking of some of the other judges, including you. And I'm thinking, no, it's not biased. Right. There are various courtrooms, and they're packed dockets. And if you're a defendant and you come in there and you don't have the right mannerisms, don't have an attorney that's fighting for you, you can get caught up in the system, and there are plenty of people that are over in jail that didn't do what they were convicted of. But my thing was, the criminal justice system doesn't start in the courtroom. And yes. that's where I'm talking yeah. about there is bias. It starts long before they get to the courtroom. And I think that um, the black male isn't given the benefit of the doubt. What's life been like growing up for you here in Baltimore? It's been kind of shaky dealing with my mom and her habits. Because my mom, she's a recovering addict. 17 year old Darius Gibson is an honor student who has never been in trouble with the law. But his college plans are in serious jeopardy after a drug raid on his family's home in which he was arrested. Facing five years for drug and gun charges linked to drug paraphernalia he says belongs to his mother and a broken gun that belongs to a relative, Darius is frustrated because he says police have refused to give him the benefit of the doubt. Darius, you're gonna enter one of the, the scariest systems on this planet, the American judicial system for a black male. You know that, don't you? Yes. So when, as you get closer to this, when you go to bed at night, I need you to tell me what it is you're considering, what you're thinking, what's going through your mind. In my mind, I'm thinking, am I really going to get away from this? Or am I going to end up like some of my family members that have been locked up? But if I wake up at night, all I do is pray and just pray to God that he'll have my back. Because I know my attorney does, my family and friends do. And I'm just hoping the judge will see that I'm innocent. You can't win. You can't win. You can't argue your point. 
you can't, nothing. I mean, any contact with Baltimore City police, you can't win. Ali Bay doesn't like Darius's chances of success in court because he's had so little of it himself over the last 20 years. He was first convicted of a crime when he was 13 years old. How many times have you had law enforcement contact in your life? A lot. What's a lot? Um, multiple times. Five times. A little higher. Ten times. A little bit more higher. You've had more than ten law enforcement contacts? Yes. Fifteen? Um, I know it's more than ten. Who do you blame for your ten plus law enforcement contacts? Um, I can blame myself for some, and I also can blame the whole process of how the city is. Baltimore. It's just that in Baltimore, the, um, the police are always going to look at you different. You're always going to be singled out. I'm not saying it's all police, but we're talking majority of them. It's just the whole entire system, the judiciary system in Maryland. Isaac Sawyer is just eight years old, but already his mother worries he could one day enter that system. I used to say that I, my, my, how do I put this? I guess not my biggest fear, but I used to say, I'm gonna be standing in front of the judge telling him, please don't give my son the death penalty. He's just a product of his environment. And he tried and he, it's, it's hard to think that one day your son's gonna be in jail, that your son's gonna be, but I, I'm realistic about things and with the way his education is going now and with the, the way his behavior is and like you said, Baltimore City and the, I, I think it's a good, it's very strong possibility that he will be and it scares me. Before becoming mayor of Baltimore, Kurt Schmoke was a federal prosecutor. He says there is definitely a bias in the criminal justice system against the poor. Well, the, the criminal justice system is biased against low income people. That's, that's the issue. I mean, and so to the extent that we have more African-American men that are low income, uh, it's going to have a negative impact. I mean, two, two guys committing uh, a charge with the same crime, um, uh, one who has resources gets out on bail, the other one is stuck uh, in the system. Um, uh, one gets a private attorney, one gets uh, a public defender, no offense, but uh, we know uh, that um, resources make a big difference in the criminal justice system. So the system is biased uh, against uh, those who are low income and that has a terrible, terrible impact on the African American community. They're disadvantaged in income, they're dif disadvantaged in jobs, they're dis disadvantaged in education. I don't think they're treated in a negative way merely because of that, but it means that we don't have the programs and services and other th types of things that are necessary to bring them from that disadvantaged situation to a positive situation. And a lack of fathers in the home also negatively impacts black males. In 2010, 24% of American families lived in single parent homes. 66% of black children are raised in single-parent households. The overwhelming majority of those homes are led by women. Darius and Isaac are products of female-led single-parent households. So am I. So too is Cliff White. Hey, how you doing? Dude. What's going on? I do on? know this face. <laughs> I do know this face. Of course, I had a mustache in those days, of course. Wiley is a former All-American track athlete. This is my mother, Shirley Wiley. This is Tom. Shirley, oh, how are you? His mother, Shirley Wiley, raised a total of 11 children, nine of her own, as well as two grandchildren. All with the help of her mother, Cliff's grandmother. All but one of Shirley's children had early success. 
And she did it in one of the poorest parts of Baltimore. I would just like them to you know, have a life and just do better, do better than I did, because, you know, go to college, try to get a good job, try to, you know, take care of your kids and things like that, you know. She says her secret was a strong family unit, stressing the importance of education and discipline. How'd you do her, Shirley? I had a little belt. You had a belt. I knew it was a belt. I had a little belt. Mm, tapped a little legs. You tapped it. You just, it was yeah. a little light not tap. No, not no... Nothing heavy. No. No marks. No, no marks. Nothing. It no. did well. No, right. right. No raised skin. Right. My mother is very, very polite. She's very, very polite to you, okay? She said she kind of tapped you a little bit and everything. She didn't tap you, okay? Um, she's heavy-handed, okay, she, and fast, okay, and fast. My older brother and I went into a five-and-dime store, and we were going and we stole something. We stole something. I can hear her saying right now, I can't stand a thief and I hate a liar, okay? And I rem and I don't know whether we were one, I, I don't know whether I was first, first grade, kindergarten, or wherever it was, but I never stole another thing for the rest of my life, okay? And I remember that whooping to this day, okay? I certainly made life difficult for my mother once we moved to a neighborhood outside of Baltimore. Again, I was attending a nearly all-white high school and getting another shot at a better education. But again, feelings of insecurity and defensiveness returned. But this time, when I acted out, I was tempting more serious trouble. And that's what I did here. I, I stole records and, and other small things. I guess because of peer pressure. Not thinking about the consequences, really. You get away with something the first time, you kind of think you're invincible. And that's what I thought at the time. I thought I was invincible. I, I certainly wasn't thinking about my future and what all this would mean. That all changed when I was caught stealing snack food from a supermarket. Someone called the principal, the, 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 the principal at my high school, who sent the vice principal over to literally pick me up and get me back to school. My vice principal at the time, Mr. Owens, gave me a break. He didn't call the police, and he didn't kick me out of high school. From that moment on, I stuck close to one of my best friends in high school, Reggie Brooks. What the hell? He was a star on the football and basketball teams, and some of his discipline rubbed off on me. Today, he is the athletic director of a high school just outside of Baltimore, and he is still beating me at basketball. <laughs> Single-parent households make the role of highly functioning schools essential in the development of black boys. Without a father in the home, the work of a single mother is often overwhelming. Is his father in his life in any significant way? No, not at all. Can you put it away? Thank you. My son asked me about his father, and I told myself that I won't talk bad about his father to him because you never know what might happen in the future. They yeah. might have a wonderful relationship later on in life. But when he asked me, I say, he's not here. If he wanted to be, he would be. I'm here. And I leave it at that. But when you take your son to the mall and he stands in front of the wishing well and you give him a dime to throw in and he looks at the dime and says, I wish my daddy would come see me. Broke, broke down crying. Couldn't help it. Start to tear up when I think about it right now. It's terrible. But you can't make anybody be there that doesn't want to be. And I'm mommy, I'm daddy. <laughs> and you got Aunt Kika, and you got Uncle Blue. So, have my uncle, his uncle Frank, my brother. So, he has, he has people who cares about him. And I know it hurts him that his father's not there. Just like it hurt me growing up when my father wasn't there. Hopefully, we're enough for him. That's how I try to look at it. We have blessed our mommies. Bless our mommies. Bless our daddies. You just want what's best for your kids, and you try to give it to them, but 
people don't realize how hard it is. How literally hard it is for you to try to raise a child. Period. Much less by yourself. <laughs> but I think people take it for granted. The time they get to spend with their kids. The fact that they can take off and go to the kids' Sunday t-ball game and that they can... People take a lot of stuff for granted and they don't realize. A little. I know that when a child is willing to work hard, when a parent says, I'm going to work with my son, and make sure this boy gets what he needs. What does he need? And I say he needs to learn to read, to compute, to study, to respect people, to keep his room clean. And you've got a family working to do that, whether it's a grandmother or whoever it is. If there's somebody in that home helping that child to do the right thing, that child will be OK. But Rabowski knows that America needs much more than just OK to reverse years of academic declines, particularly where African Americans are concerned. Right now, South Korea leads the world in producing engineers and scientists. In America, just 6% of those 24 years old or older have degrees in science and engineering. And of that 6%, about 2% of those Americans with degrees in science and engineering are blacks and Hispanics. Given those statistics, you'd think there would be outrage from civil rights and political leaders on this issue. You'd be wrong. It's not sustained. It, it, it comes in spurts, you know, particularly if there's a crisis or something in the community with some of our kids that are not doing something. If we get a kid, forbid, you know, to get murdered out in the community, then you hear the outrage. But there's nothing that I don't think that's sustained and long term that can really get people's attention, grab their ear and say, this is what we need to do to impact education. The level of outrage that we should have coming from many segments of our communities, black community, white, uh, is not there. Um, and I think it's for a variety of reasons. There are a lot of success stories uh, out there. That's, that's one thing. So help you God. So help me God. Congratulations, Mr. President. We had a, a huge success, symbolic success, in having a black person elected president of the United States. And it's hard then to argue to the broader community um, that black people aren't making progress the way every other minority group in the country is not making, uh, has made progress in the history uh, of, of this country. Until we resolve this issue, which I think is such a civil rights issue, I think it is the civil rights issue. People talk about technology being a civil rights issue. No, when we're talking about human beings as a class not having opportunities, having those extinguished early on in elementary school, what can we hope for as a nation in terms of our competitiveness? So it's not only the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. Yes! Yeah, Darius! Yeah, yeah Darius! Hey, Darius. Just this yeah, baby! Just a week after meeting him, and on one of the most decisive days of his young life, Darius gets the kind of break my vice principal gave me years ago. The judge at his hearing on weapon and drug charges dismisses the case against him. The case has been dismissed, and hopefully I get an expansion day during my career in electrical engineering at State University. You're looking forward to going to college, huh? Yeah? Of course. It's not his fault that his mother's a recovering addict. It is not. And despite the fact that I've been struggling all his life, all his life, he triumphed. My baby, an honor student, he got a scholarship. I won't let him go down for something I did, no. Mm -mm. Darius gets to go to college and pursue his dream of becoming an electrical engineer. But what about Isaac Sawyer? Is Isaac going to be OK? I know he is, because I'm going to make sure he is OK. 
when I was younger, right before I had Isaac, I was a little hood rat. I was a little hood rat running the street. And running. Isaac is the best thing that's ever happened to me. It made me calm down completely because I knew at the end of the day, if nobody else needed me, if nobody else loved me, he did. And it just changed everything. It made me calm down, get a job, be normal. <laughs> What's clear to me is this. If the idea of American exceptionalism is to be more than a slogan, education has to lead the way. And no child can be left behind. The minimum, non-negotiable, has to be that every black boy in America be able to read at grade level and attend some college. Surely, setting reading and college as non-negotiables for black boys can't be that difficult for a race that has achieved so much in America while overcoming so much. So the question, do I believe we'll solve the problem of black males? We have no choice. We have no choice. We have to. They are Americans. I mean, what makes America special is when we've had problems in the past and we've had problems that seem insurmountable. We couldn't get this country to even talk about slavery. For a long time, they had to disagree. Let's not even talk about it, right? We went to war within ourselves because of those kinds of issues, and yet we finally came to grips. You and I could not have imagined being in our positions. When we were children, we could not have imagined being on major television or being the president of a predominantly white university, and yet that's how far this country has come. And what made the difference? Education. Education transforms lives. Education transforms lives. Yes, it can. For Eddie, Darius, Stephen, and Isaac. And yes, it has for this black boy from a single parent household and humble beginnings from Baltimore, Maryland.